I personally believe generative AI is somewhere between the invention of the uh, internal combustion engine and the internet, right? I, li I think the impact on the world is somewhere between the two. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder, Adam Taggart. From almost out of nowhere, interest in artificial intelligence, also referred to as AI, is suddenly white hot. Why? What happened that suddenly made it the darling of media headlines and principal driver of stock market valuation? For answers and a layman's overview of the underlying technology itself, we're fortunate to be joined by Dylan Patel, tech expert and chief analyst at Semi Analysis. Dylan, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Hey, it's a real pleasure. Um, so appreciate you coming on the channel on short notice. You were recommended to me by Peter Bookvar, who saw you present at a private event and uh, said to me, Adam, if your audience wants to learn about AI, this is the guy to talk to. So again, really glad you could make yourself available here. Um, all right, this is a bit of a tall order for you, but can you just give a quick summary of what AI is? Uh, how does it differ from other types of computing? Sure, so AI is, you can think of it as almost brute forcing it. Right. So when you think about, you know, classical, you know, standard computing, it's it's rules based. Right. It's it's, hey, if this happens, do this. Hey, multiply these numbers together, add them together. What's the result? Divide them. OK, there's the number that I was looking for. There's my margin or there's my, you know, whatever number I'm looking for. Uh, but AI is 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 brute forcing it in, in an unimaginable way. Right. So um, when you think about vision you know computer vision right you know robots being able to cars being able to drive themselves or or you know being able to detect hey this is a uh, bad skittle when i'm manufacturing a ton of skittles that is that is one level of like brute, brute forcing but when you think about what these language models which is what everyone's excited about right these generative ai language models these are brute forcing it to an unimaginable sense so you know i kind of want you to imagine you know a piece of paper right a piece of paper with just a bunch of numbers on it, 50 different numbers on there, right? And I want you to think about, okay, what are, what are these 50 different numbers? Are? They're, 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 you can think of them as a neuron in your brain, right? Uh, or a neuron on a piece of paper, right? 50 of them. Now, I want you to stack them all the way from New York City to Chicago. That is the scale, and, that, and you have to go through all of those numbers and multiply by all of them, right, in, in the most simple terms, to get to the scale of the model BERT, BERT which was released in 2018. Right now, you stack these numbers all the way to the moon. That is the scale of GPT-3, which was released in 2020. Now, if we talk about GPT-4, right, the model that everyone is losing their minds about, right, on Chat GPT, that would go to the moon and back 22 times. These pieces of paper, if you just laid them out, right, and that's how much you have to it, it effectively. Each of those numbers is a parameter or maybe a neuron, right? You have to multiply that many times. Multiply add, you know, various forms of math. That's the scale of what this is doing. And it's doing this every single time it generates four letters, right? So the scale of you know, what's, what's going on is unimaginable in terms of this is just brute forcing, right? You know, we, don't, it doesn't, we don't know how it works because it's just brute forcing it, right? Um, and and, and you know, I, I try, you know, there's, there's so many more technical details I'm kind of glossing over, but that is the scale of the AI that we're talking about and why we don't understand how it works really, besides that it's a crap load of math. In interesting. Okay, so let me just make sure I and everyone watching here gets what you mean by brute force. Um, so let me give an example, and you tell me if this is an apt example or not. Let's say there is a password, right? Um, and uh, we want to use computational power to, to figure out what that password is. Brute force is basically just taking guesses at that password. And if we had one computer... And if there were trillions of iterations of that password, and we could do an iteration a second, it could literally take us trillions and trillions of seconds to guess that password using that single computer. But with a brute force approach, let's say we were able to make trillions of guesses a second because we had the means to do so, we could probably crack that password really quickly just because we're able to do so many attempts all at once. Is that sort of what you mean by brute force? Yeah, but in, in, in sort of a, a reverse order in terms of, hey, we have all of this data, which is basically effectively the internet, right? Wikipedia, Reddit, Twitter, uh, you know, all of these various books. Let's feed them through this model, 
which is effectively just a ton, ton and ton of numbers. And every time we feed a unit of data in, which is basically a word, right? Every time we feed a word in, we feed in all the preceding words and the next word, right? And we say, hey, modify all of these numbers, which are your parameters, and you have trillions of them, right? In the scale of GPT-4, right? So if you lay these numbers out, you know, 50 pieces of 50 numbers per piece of paper, all the way to the moon and back 22 times, right? So if we talk about this is the scale, you know, that many numbers, I want you to update all of those numbers so that your answer approximates what the next word is. And you iterate through this over and over and over as you train this AI. And then eventually you've kind of encoded all of the words that you, you know, all your training data set, which is Wikipedia and all these books and Reddit and Twitter and YouTube and all of these sorts of pieces of media are encoded into the model through brute force, right? And why don't we understand how it works or why does it make up things all the time is because all of this data is encoded into trillions of parameters, right? And these parameters are effectively numbers um, on a piece of paper, if you want to think about it. And so, and every single time we feed a unit of data in, all of those numbers are modified slightly, right? So why do we not understand is because no one human can comprehend what all these numbers mean, or, you know, you can't, you can't go order by order of these operations because you simply can't understand that, right? There's no time in a human's life to go through that many uh, numbers. So you're brute forcing it by feeding all this data in and then when you say, hey, let's put a prompt in to the model and then it gets something out like, hey, uh, you know, write a poem about X, Y, Z, right? And it spits out a poem. It, you don't, we don't know how it generated it because all we've done is feed it a ton of data and it's, multipl and it's multiplying and adding and by a, a, a metric load of numbers. And it comes out with this, you know, four letter response. And then you go back through and you keep doing that. And that's how it's kind of a brute force approach, whereas you know, more standard computing, we actually are building rules in, right? If this happens, do that, add these numbers together because, you know, this is the ledger in my account, right? These are more simplistic things that are kind of, kind of programmatic, right? Whereas an AI model is just brute forcing in data and then you've built this model and now let's see what the model outputs when you input things in. Okay, um, you're raising a couple of key points I wanna dive into. I'm trying to figure out which one to go to first. Um, I do understand the difference between the different types of AI, right? So there's generative AI, which I believe is what you're talking about right now, right? Where you basically say, create something for me, generate something for me, right? Like a poem. There's predictive AI, I believe. There might be other forms. I'll let you explain those in a second. But, but before we do that, let me ask a much higher level question. Because it's brute force, does AI understand what it's doing? Like, is there actual intelligence there or is it just a highly, highly honed output, like an equation, right? We just, we just brute forced things through there. And yes, it came up with an eerily prescient poem, but does AI really understand how to create an eerily prescient poem or, or, or is it just like a trained dog where we've just trained it to do that? It has no idea what it's doing, right? All it's programmed to do is either generate the next four, you know, in terms of a large language model, generate the next four letters. That's, that's all it's trained to do, right? You input something, it runs through all of the math, and it just outputs the next four letters. It's just predicting what would be the next four letters in the sequence that you input it into me. That's all, all right, it, 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 sorry, sorry, let, let me interrupt you just because you've mentioned this a couple of times. You say the next four letters, is that literally all chat DPT does? Is, is go yeah, by so four letters at a time, almost you, like a genetic code? <laughs> If you kind of record your screen or you look very closely, it's actually outputting a token at a time. And a token is effectively four letters. It can okay. also be less, it can be a little more, but in general, it's about four letters, right? And so when you when you look at ChatGPT or any other large language model, generally you're looking at it and it's generating a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. Because what's it, what it's doing is you gave it a prompt, right? Write me a poem about dogs and cats, right? And then, and then it, it predicts, hey, I've got this input, you know, I, and, and all of my data that was, was trained into this model, let's brute force, what's the next word? Well, obviously the next word that I would predict that's most likely is dog, right? And then, and then I append that to the prompt, right? And this is what ChatGPT does. does. It takes that letter, you know, say dog, like the next word, it puts it in the beginning and says, write me a poem about dogs and cats. And then the next word is dog. And then it's like, okay, let's run this through the model again. Okay, and it says dogs are. Right. And then you run that through again but in, in, and you keep appending whatever you generated back to the beginning. And this is all it does. ChatGPT doesn't even know what the prompt is versus what it's generated. Actually, once it starts generating, it has no idea 
whether what you said is the prompt or what it generated and put back into the beginning because it's iterating through over and over and over to generate four letters or approximately four letters a token, right? And so this is, it has no idea what it's doing. And so you'll see like, hey, why does it have so much emotion? Well, it's because we've encoded all this data about emotion into it because it read all these books about, you know, Romeo and Juliet and, you know, Hamlet and all these other things, right? And Wikipedia and Reddit and Twitter. So it's learned all these things, but really all it's doing is predicting the next letter. Next okay. letter. It, it, to be clear, it doesn't understand emotion. It's just been trained on emotional words, correct? <laughs> Exactly. It has, it has no motive in, it, in and of itself, right? It's just trained on those emotional words. But it turns out, right, it was trained on both, hey, self-help and also on, you know, the bully who's bullying someone else on the internet. And so you can get it to say, you know, all sorts of emotive things, right? Positive, negative, uh, hateful, loving, caring, you know, every sort of emotion because all of that is on the internet, right? And that's what it was trained on. Um, and so all of these sorts of things are there. It has no comprehension of them. But if you give it the you know, correct prompt and it starts generating the next word, it might predict that, hey, this is a scenario, the scenario that I remember the most from my training data, remember, right, it's just encoded in it, is, hey, actually the next word is some bully writing some you know, bullying type thing. So interesting. So um, I, I wanna ask how AI learns, and I'm gonna put it learns in quotation marks too. Um, so sticking with this example of the emotional poem, I understand that if we feed it a bunch of emotional input, it's going to likely create a poem that sounds emotional. How does it get good at writing good poems or better poems? Is there some sort of feedback mechanism and maybe it's human driven that says, okay, that poem sucked, but that one's good. And, and it learns, quote unquote, to write better poetry over time. So the people who are building the model, right, are obviously, you know, there's there's so much human data out there, but we don't have enough computational horsepower, right, in terms of chips uh, to, to actually train it on all of the internet, right? We're not even at 1% of the internet. So, but we do have, you know, people who can say, hey, actually, we should just train it on all of Wikipedia because Wikipedia is a pretty good source of data, right? I mean, you know, whatever qualms you have against Wikipedia, if you were to say, let's take a website and just grab everything from it, Wikipedia is probably in the top 10. Right. Um, but then there's also a lot of other places it's like, do I really want all of Twitter? You know, there's a lot of bad stuff on Twitter. <laughs> well, yeah. So let's filter. It. So if it says X, Y, Z, maybe we throw it out. But if it says, Z, you know, uh, ABC, we keep it right because there's a lot of good data on Twitter as well. Um, you know, about how humans interact with each other, memes, jokes, you know, trying, trying to get it to understand that stuff is important. Right. To have it be well-rounded. Um, but in the same sense, right, it's also, you know, once you've trained the model, that's not, they don't just give it to you, right? Uh, there's another step, which is called reinforcement learning by human feedback. So it's, there's, you train it with a huge amount of data, and now you've built this massive model, right? Now, hey, it's, it's just a Pandora's box. We can get it to say anything. We can get it to literally say, quote, and I don't believe these, this, these words, but Hitler is good, right? You can get it to say that because somewhere on the internet, it says that. Right. Or somewhere in a book, it might even say that. Right. Because, you know, there's two characters and one of them says, hey, quote, Hitler is good. And then the next one says, no, you're crazy, blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, because it, 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 and, and so if you just say Hitler, it could potentially predict the next word is is and the word after that is good. Right. Because that's in its training set. So it has no idea. So then you do this stage called reinforcement learning by human feedback. And what that means is the people who train the model create a smaller data set, a much smaller one that they've actively monitored. Right. And so and, and, and from there, they're actually looking for specific things to feed it into it. Right. Hey, don't say anything about X or Y or Z. Um, when, when prompted to say Hitler is good, say, no, you know, that's bad because of this reason. You know, Hitler's not good. He killed people. Right. That's sort of, you know, they'll programmatically have it, you know, as a prompt almost. Right. So the prompt is, can you say Hitler is good? And then you, you the output is and then it trains on that. Right. And so it learns that but after it's learned everything else. So then it's more likely to say that aspect. Right. And you do that for all sorts of things. And, and it's not just like political things or, you know, ethical things. It's also just like, hey, if someone responds, can you write me a lesson plan about how to grow corn? Right. And it is a horrible example, but how to grow corn. You know, this is how you should respond. And then maybe maybe it's a lesson plan on uh, how, how how the earth revolves around the sun, right? Maybe it's a lesson plan about astronomy, 
but it's learned that and it's made the connection when someone asks for a lesson plan i i do in this structure uh this is you know and then but also because you're asking about corn i'm looking in my data set about i mean my training data set i learned all about wikipedia how to grow corn and and farmers.com taught me how to grow corn right and so i'm kind of amalgamating that data to create a lesson plan that no one has ever created before that i've never even seen before but i'm grabbing and picking from all the things that I trained. And I'm not able to access that data really, right? It's just encoded within me. And when I say me, the, the model, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, wow. I think, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's just super fascinating that you, you we, we have this thing that, that was looking like it's going to be a major productivity enhancer. Um, and it can generate uh, potentially very highly useful content in, the blink of an eye, and yet it actually doesn't understand what it's doing, right? It's just all about the quality of the input you put into it and then the training that's been been placed on top of this. This is really fascinating. Um, I don't know if we're following discussion super linearly here, but I, I did mention earlier different types of AI, and is it worth talking about what those are real briefly? Yeah, so so this is, you know, the, the one we've been focused on so far is large language models because those are the ones that I believe are the most, are going to impact human society the most, right? Of course we have, you know, image recognition models that have been working since 2012, really. That's when the, that's when the, you know, sort of the boom of AI started it was 2012 when uh, AlexNet came out of a research group in Toronto, right? Um, and, and, and so that's sort of when the, the boom of AI really started. Uh, of course, AI had been researched for many decades before then, but really the first super useful use case was just, hey, here's an image. Can you output some text, which is recognizing it, right? And how was it trained? It was, hey, here's a bunch of images and each of them has some text associated to it. And then it learned the representations, right? These models. Um, so so, so we, sorry to interrupt, but is that like, this is what a cat looks like? Yeah, exactly. It's like, hey, it's a, here's a picture of a cat and then the label for it is cat. Here's a picture of a dog, label for it is dog. Here's a picture of a gorilla. Here, here's a label for gorilla. And, and basically what we there's been that whole kind of model, you know, image image recognition models, which have been built and built and built and built and built and are slowly getting to the point where they can drive cars on the roads, right? Or at least they can recognize everything in the scene and say, this is a road, this is a car. Hey, I shouldn't drive there because there's a car there, right? That sort of stuff. And it's not really a generative image or a generative model, right? It's only recognizing what's going on. It's understanding what's going on. It's perceiving what's going on, um, but it's not, it's not generating new things. Right. And so this sort of model is completely different. Right. And there's ones for voice recognition. Right. I mean, we've been using voice to text for quite some time now, um, you know, on our phones. It's 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 tremendously helpful, especially for folks who aren't good at typing uh, with their, with, you know, with their hands. Right. Um, so so, you know, that's a whole, that's more similar. Right. Uh, you know, recognize the voice, turn it into text. That's not generating anything. Right. So this is a different kind of these are different kinds of models. Right. So what those those have been around and those continue to improve. And we've kind of recognized implications Right, hey, one day cars are going to drive themselves. And, you know, I think like two to three million Americans drive for a living. Right. Well, what's going to happen to them? Well, most likely it's going to slowly drop. Right. Maybe maybe the car can't drive all the way or the truck can't drive all the way from Walmart's depot here to the Walmart store. But maybe, you know, a driver can take it out of the depot, put it on near, right next to the road, get out and go back and take another one to there. And then from right on the side of the road, it can drive all the way to the right next to where the other distribution center is. And then, you know, another human can. Right. So we'll get along the way. We'll get to the point where cars can drive themselves and trucks can drive themselves. But over time, that two to three million people will decline in terms of how many people are driving for a living, right? But we've recognized those implications for many years now. The sort of, and, and, and sort of the, the economy has recognized that, the markets recognize that's gonna happen over time. When is a big question, of course, um, you know, is it, is it two years from now, is it 10 years from now? But the generative models, right? So, hey, generate an image, or hey, generate the next word in this, in this, in this large language model. Those are the ones that are really, really what everyone's going crazy about because no one's ever seen this before, right? I mean, we've had it since effectively 2018, but they were nowhere near as good as sort of aha moment when ChatGPT came out in 2020, uh, you know, November 2022. Okay, and it sounds like <clears throat> um, the capacity uh, or the computational power is increasing exponentially, maybe even hyper exponentially, if that's a word. Um, you know, we went from New York to Chicago to the moon to now the moon in the back 22 times. 
uh, presumably the next jump is going to be even more mind boggling and impossible for the human brain to understand. W what's the pace of these cycle upgrades? Like, like when is the next iteration of, of chat GPT uh, likely to hit? And, and what would that scale be? Would that be back to the moon 2200 times or? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a big question because we've sort of, you know, um, you know, gotten to the point where the, you know, these large language models, especially, uh, you know, GPT-4, which was trained in, you know, 2022, but before ChatGPT was released, they started training it. That machine that they trained it on cost somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 million to $500 million, right? To build that supercomputer. Um, in, in, in terms of, you know, hey, was this worth it? The company that trained it, OpenAI, was not sure, you know, they, they, I mean, they were, they were building it because they were sure, but everyone else in the world would have been like, what are you doing? You're building this big of a supercomputer to train this model, and we have no idea if there's going to be an economic use for it, right? Um, you know, I, I bet you 99% of people would have been like, this makes no sense. Why are you doing this? Now, I bet a whole lot more people are like, yes, this makes sense. Mm -hmm. Let's throw way more money at OpenAI. And, and so you see, you know, Microsoft signing a deal with OpenAI for, what, $10 billion plus dollars. Um, you know, so maybe maybe it's not a seven hundred million dollar, five hundred million dollar model that we're, or machine that we're building. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's a tens of billions of dollars of machine, and OpenAI is renting it from Microsoft for ten billion dollars, right? right? And 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 that's a small investment for Microsoft, a multi trillion dollar company to make. I mean, it's not it's not inconceivable, right? It's it's a pretty doable investment for them if they decide to do it. And, and they have absolutely right. I mean, if you look at any any tech CEO, they'll say, "Yeah, this is somewhere where I want to invest billions, tens of billions." Uh, I, I bet I bet you if you asked if you sat down Sachin Nadella and told him, "Hey, uh, to build GPT five is going to take a hundred trillion dollars or a hundred billion dollars," he'd say, "Yes, let's do it," because the value of what could be made. You know, we've had order of magnitude increases actually. So, so the the adage has been the model size, right? So the size of that model, right? You remember I talked about from Chicago, uh, from Illa, uh, Chicago to New York, right? If I were to double that, then that gets me to you know Los Angeles, maybe, right? That was that was happening every three months for a period of time. But then we started to plateau out because oh my god, five hundred million dollars, seven hundred million dollars. What is that? Is that worth it? Because we're not sure, right? If we're what we're building is worth it, right? Um, now everyone in the world is convinced it's worth it. And so you've seen so much money pour in. Not only is, you know, Microsoft investing in open AI, you know, Google was always investing, but more quietly on their own on this. Uh, but, you know, so many other companies, Meta's completely changed their mind about, you know, uh, not changed their mind, but they've invested a whole lot more into GPUs. In fact, they're built, they're buying not, not 500 million to $700 million worth of GPUs. I believe they're buying somewhere from the, in the neighborhood of five to $8 billion of GPUs this year, right? Of chips, right? Chips to train this month. They're buying five to eight billion dollars worth this year, and next year will be more, right? And you look across the world, uh, you know, it's more. Many many companies are doing VCs are pouring money into startups to do this. Uh, you know, there's there's enterprises who maybe they're maybe they're not going for GPT four or five, right? But they're going for hey, can we bring GPT three, but for my specific use case, right? Um, hey, I'm Coca Cola. I have 50 years of PDFs and emails, uh, and no one person at the company understands every process. Why don't we teach it everything? from all of our emails and PDFs and Word documents. And now if anyone wants to understand a process, they can go ask our bot. And the bot might you know, be incorrect sometimes, but it's gonna be a whole lot better than chasing around the company of over 100,000 people to find the right person to talk to about the right process to implement something, right? So there's companies that are doing this too, uh, enterprises, and it doesn't need to be the biggest model in the world. It could be, hey, a much smaller model, but on my data, right? Because this, this technology is unlocked you know, sort of chat GPT made everyone's eyes open up onto what's the possibility, not only for this crazy, crazy model that's super huge, but also for a much smaller model, right? Wendy's is doing this and they want to replace drive through ordering with this, right? Uh, attach a voice synthesis bot to a, you know, sort of their own chat GPT kind of uh, model. And now we just take orders with it. Right. And, and, and how are they going to do this? They're going to record it. I mean, they've already been doing this. They're going to record every single you know, interaction in the drive through and figure out what the correct order was based on the interaction and then train the model. Right. This is what they're doing. So, so, you know, there's so many applications for this across the world, you know, from small to big. Right. It doesn't have to be crazy ones like, you know, oh, my God, replace humans for so many things. Right. It could be as simple as drive through order. 
um, or assisting people with things. You know, Google's investing hugely into the medical field, right? Hey, doctors are great, but they're, they're horrible at explaining that, things to that, me. <laughs> that, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Or even just the diagnostic process, right? Which is just you feed in a ton of medical data. If we see symptom X, then X percent, you know, is likely to be the condition, right? And G GPD can handle a ton of information. So if it's a multifactorial diagnosis, they can probably do it a lot better than most humans once they're they're up and trained. And, and, and so Google has this model called MedPalm. MedPalm. Um, Palm is their, is their sort of GPT model, and MedPalm is, is specifically tuned for the medical field. Turns out, right, like if my, if my dad or my gr grandfather goes to the doctor and they talk about their symptoms, you know, you know, doctors like, is it a sharp pain? Is it a dull pain? Is it a numbing pain? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> it hurts, right? And, you know, in, in terms of, but it's like, hey, what if, what if we taught it in this scenario, when the blood levels say this about my cholesterol and this about my sugar and this and this and this, and the human being is saying this, it means this. And you can do this across millions of people's data instead of the doctor who's only seen, you know, amazing as they are, and they're definitely still needed, you know, how many patients have they seen in their lifetime? How many times have somebody complained about this exactly, right? And they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna be, you know, in, with with assistance, you know, they'll they'll be able to be guided in the right direction. Oh, this actually means, you know, oh, it's just, you know, you just need some Tylenol. You're fine. You're complaining. Or oh, wow, you might we need to get you an MRI because there might be like a tumor or something, right? Or hey, your hormones are all messed up because your gallbladder. I don't, I don't know anything about med medicine, but you know, just, just uh, there's, there's all sorts of symptoms that patients are imperfect at. Uh, and, and so being able to hone in on what those patient, those symptoms that people don't understand are, and being able to actually still get to what's the problem is a tremendously difficult task. But if we yeah. feed it millions and millions of patients' data and interactions with doctors, maybe it can be better than doctors at this. Right, because it may find correlations that are just non-intuitive to average people. And and look, not not trying to say, look, chat GPT is going to replace doctors, but imagine how much more advantage the doctor is walking in to see a patient if he's just gotten a readout from chat GPT that says, okay, I think these are the probabilities of what this guy has. 87% chance this is the problem, you know, 30% chance it's this, 10% chance it's this. And the doctor then knows how to prioritize what he's looking at right there, right? So fascinating. And that's just, again, one example. So one of the questions I had here for you was, was how transformative is this going to be to commerce and society? I think we've already talked about a couple of examples. It sounds like you said, hey, it's going to be pretty big from the spectrum of the relatively small and straightforward like drive-through orders to the other end, which is maybe like, you know, completely up-leveling healthcare in the world. Are there any other like major applications that we haven't talked about yet that are worth just putting on people's radars? I think one of the industries that's being disrupted the most is actually uh, programming, right? Uh, programming, you know, you know, all the sort of the, 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 you know, hey, do this if that happens. Hey, when this data gets here, do this. Oh, if this, this, this shows up in the data, we need to set an alert out. All this sort of stuff is tremendously accelerated by um, by these generative uh, large language models, right? Why? Because programming is literally just language, right? It's language in a specific format that computers can understand. And there's many different languages and there's so much code out there. So, so this is one of the industries that's being revolutionized the most. Uh, one, because people are adopting it faster, of course, in that industry versus other industries. But two, because there is a lot of work that happens, right? There is definitely a lot of like very important work, but every job has menial stuff, right? And and programming is no different, right? I've, I've programmed a lot in my life. And, you know, I, I, there's definitely stuff that's menial on there. Like, uh, and, and and so that's one of the areas that's being revolutionized that kind of kind of by, by these applications, right? Um, you know, hey, document drafting. Hey, there's there's legal cases where lawyers have used ChatGPT too much, right? And they've been caught, you know, have, with fake legal cases. You know, so it's like there's there's you know the sky is the limit in terms of what could actually be done with these models. In my opinion, um, you know, wh where where people are going with them uh, and and what applications people are building. You you could think about it, any any sort of place in the world obviously you know the trades plumbers i i, I highly doubt a plumber is ever going to be you know assisted by a, a large language model maybe um but maybe their you know their calls are right you know call plumber hey schedule for me all of that could be handled by a model because the model sees your schedule and knows exactly where everyone is you know where you where the house is where the plumber is uh you know he said, "Hey, he, he, hey, my, my my wife and I have our anniversary dinner, so we're definitely not doing it today, right? It's gonna maybe he can schedule for you, right? But but definitely not replace a, some jobs, but other jobs. You know, I, I, the way I like to think of it is, it's not about 
you know, jobs getting replaced because yeah, sure, the plow and plow and tractor and all those things made our economy go from 90% of people in farming to less than 1%, or right? at least in the US. Um, and that's happening across the world as well, you know, more slowly in other places. But in the US, over 90% of people were farming at one point, right? Or in the in the in the food growing industry. Um, and now it's less than 1%. Well, you know, what what does AI do to the world? Uh, you know, no clue, generative AI, no clue, right? But it's certainly not going to just like collapse the economy. If anything, it's going to make more abundance, more wealth. Uh, it's 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 about what's going to happen structurally in society, right? As 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 certain jobs get deprioritized and other jobs, you know, a boom out of nowhere. All right, let me let me dig into that um, real quick before I do. I just want to ask a question on one of the examples you mentioned. Um, in the case of of using AI to write software. Um, totally get it, right? As like you said, it's just words, just in a different format. Um, and I can see how that could be super helpful where you could tell, you know, AI, all right, you know, write me some software that does X, right? Um, but software code can get big over time. And and um, let's say it gets big and there's an error in it, right? And so all of a sudden you get a bunch of code and it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Can AI actually do the debugging or do you actually need a live person to crawl in there and figure out why it's not working? So one of the you know things or misnomers is that AI is going to replace the whole process, right? In, in programming. No, it's not going to replace the whole prompt process, but it's more like, hey, I, I have this function I need to write. This function might only be, you know, a dozen or two dozen lines, right? When this data gets inputted, you know, outputted in this way, in this format, and all these sorts of things, right? Hey, there's this function. And, and the AI can definitely help you write those functions. Or you can feed it in and say, hey, this function is supposed to do this, 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 but instead it's doing this. Why? What's wrong with it? Um, give, here's, here's a bunch of examples of inputs and outputs. These are wrong. Why? Which ones are wrong? You can ask it these sorts of questions and it can help you, you know, fix it. It's not going to say, hey, can you write all of Excel for me, you know, over the next week, right? The entire application of Excel, because it's just ginormous. I have no idea how big Excel is, but it's probably massive. Right. Um, but instead, it could be like, hey, we're, we're thinking about adding a new formula for this, 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 you know, then it can help you. And, and so really, the job becomes, can I supervise the AI as it does these functions? Can I think about the big picture of putting these functions together? And how do I do that efficiently? And, and without introducing a lot of bugs, how do I prompt the AI to go look at certain things and come back to me with, hey, this is wrong, this is right? That more becomes the role of an architect or a programmer. Right. And so that's maybe what's what's going on or changing in the industry. Um, and, and it'll be a steady process of change. Right. And maybe one day it can start writing, you know, you know, more simple applications. Say, write a website for me like this. You know, that's maybe something that's more simple than, you know, a big, big application like uh, what, what is my factory uh, inventory management system. Right. But it can help me start with certain functions over time. Right. And so that's that's really where I think the AI comes in and the human is the overseer. Right. Because this model doesn't think, right? Again, it doesn't think. It just what is the next what is the next word? What is the next four letters that I need to put in? Hey, do I need to put a bracket here and end this function? Okay, yeah, because obviously this function looks like it's ending. But it could also it's trained on a ton of code. That code could have bugs in it too, right? So it it might also be wrong, right? Just like we were talking about. Hey, the model could say Hitler is is a you know X Y Z person. It could also say, um, you know, hey, there should be a bracket here. Oh, there should be a comma here, but that's incorrect, right? Um, and, and so the person needs to be there driving the AI, of course, too. And so that, that's sort of the, the, the role in, in programming. And it'll, it'll be a continuum from, you know, in the beginning, very simple to, you know, as we go forward, as years go on, it becomes more and more powerful. And the architect is, you know, maybe not worrying about small details here and there, but they still understand it. They still need to be able to understand what actually happened here, there, there, there. They need to be All able right, to tell the AI to build that. Um, God, it's all just so super interesting. All right, so um, I do want to get to the point of that you touched on, which is, uh, you know, the impact that this could have on the labor market, right? And there, there are concerns that, um, oh my gosh, you know, uh, AI is just going to replace big chunks of the workforce, right? And I think what I hear you saying is, is yeah, probably, um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Right. You know, we can find it's going to create additional jobs and we can maybe put that labor to other productive use. Right. And I just want to flag this concept, which is an old concept in economics called technological displacement. And it was, to my knowledge, um, actually it, it, the proponent of it was was uh, Maynard Keynes, where he said, hey, um, 
if technology can replace human labor more efficiently and, and at better cost, yeah, you should absolutely do it. But he said, you got to be careful about the pace of the displacement. He said, if you displace too many people too quickly, where you can't redirect them in a swift period of time to, to additional productive work, you can end up creating a social cost that is higher than the cost savings of the new technology, at least in the, the interim period, right? Which can be measured in years or decades sometimes. So I, I'm just curious, um, are you not worried at all about the impact on, on labor from AI? Um, or you know, should we be looking at this as sort of a measured deployment so that, to use your example, we don't put 90% of the truckers out of work you know, in a year um, because we can't, right? We might say, yeah, we, if we really invested, we probably could, but maybe we want to make this a 10-year glide path so that you know, these guys with training so that we can help these guys deploy into something else besides just giving them all pink slips. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm certainly worried about that. Of course, you know, uh, you know what, what happens is people's jobs get replaced, right? Or get displaced. Um, you know, one perfect example is the U.S. auto industry, right? The U.S. auto industry is about to produce the same number of cars, somewhere, you know, 10 to 12 million cars every year since the 50s. You know, it's, it's bounced around, of course, recessions, it goes down. Uh, there's been times when it's gone above. Somewhere in those in that range, right? I mean, it might not have the exact number, but it's produced about the same number of cars since the 50s. Um, but the number of people working in that industry has tanked, right? And, and, and this technological displacement has done really bad things for Detroit, right? Which is this car city. Uh, you know, as far as I know, and, and, and um, you know, and, and, and many of the reason, regions around there, right? It's the Rust Belt for a reason. There, there's all sorts of, you know, byproducts from, you know, like, hey, the opioid crisis is the most strong in, in parts of the Rust Belt, right? right. Uh, which have been displaced by a lot of, you know, not it's not just the automobile industry, but many manufacturing sectors. If you look at the U.S. manufacturing output, it has actually only gone up, right? Of course, recessions, it goes down. But you know, 70s versus now, the U.S. outputs more manufactured goods, right? That is, that is a full fact, right? Of course, the U.S. consumption of manufactured goods has gone up more than the output, but, you know, that's that's a whole different topic. But the number of people working in manufacturing has gone down, right? And and those jobs, maybe, you know, one person could support, you know, a family of four or what have you, and, and the ones that got replaced with in terms of retail, maybe not. But then there are all these other jobs that pay way better, right? A software engineer, could, you know, at, at Google can actually feed, you know, a family of 50 or 20, maybe, right? A 20, family of 20, right? A software engineer in, in the Bay Area at Google. But, you know, that's obviously the money is going somewhere else than the family that got displaced, right? So that, right. that isn't obviously an issue. Um, and, and, but it's not, you know, my room to sort of say, how do we fix this, right? Uh, or how do we, how do we, you know, stop this? Uh, you know, one of, I do think it is a bit dangerous to think, hey, we should ban it, right? Because then you're saying, you know, this abundance that could be brought about, right? Which is, you know, more men, more goods and more services with less work and less people doing that work is, is obviously a good thing, right? You know, we the U.S. produces more food than ever with less than 1% of people farming. But, you know, that path to where did those farmers go and, oh, did they have to move to the city and now they work in this really horrible condition factory, right? That, that is obviously difficult for society to process, or even in the case of, you know, the Rust Belt with the opioid crisis and, uh, and any number of other issues. Uh, the U.S. is richer, but not, not exactly the same distribution. So, you know, that, I'm, not, I'm not a political science person. I'm not really a political person at all, but I definitely see the issues of this. Um, but I also recognize that, you know, it is overall going to be a positive force uh, in terms of at least the world will have more abundance. Yeah. Okay. And look, and I know you're a technologist, you know, you're, you're not a political policymaker or anything like that, but it does sound like what you're saying is, is um, this is a double-edged sword. We, we, we should make sure that we uh, take a planful approach to it and no is the fine answer to this question, but I'm just curious if Congress said, Hey, Dylan, come help us figure this out. Are, are there any particular policies in your mind that you would already recommend for this to, to, to mitigate what we're talking about here, or you haven't just thought about it all that much yet? Um, I mean, if I, if I do put on my political hat on, right, I think in general, the economy is getting more and more geared towards capital investment rather than labor investment, right? Capital mm -hmm. goods create more stuff than labor goods, right? So, so, you know, a factory that is highly automated, you know, may only have a few hundred people there, but it create it, it increases the total economic output of the U.S. far more. Um, and so, you know, in general, I would say, we should be, you know, doing sort of 
uh, you know, tax credits maybe or deductions for equipment. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the reasons the CHIPS Act is, is kind of great is because it, it provides a tax credit for equipment, right? And these semiconductor fabs, right? The, you know, the, the, the ones that, you know, TSMC's building in, in, in Arizona and Intel's building in Arizona and Ohio and Samsung's building in Texas, these produce tens of billions of dollars of output with the total employment force of, you know, 10,000, 5,000 people in that fab, in that factory, right? Uh, fabrication plant. It's, it's tremendous output for very few people. So obviously, you know, we, we need to one, encourage that those sorts of capital goods to be built in the US, right? These highly automated factories, whether it's highly automated factories building chips or highly automated factories building robots or what have you, right? We should be investing in that and then somehow figuring out how to tax that appropriately to you know, help people who are being displaced and help people who are being pushed out of the labor market and help people transition from their old job to the new job, right? That's generally what I would say, right? Not, not just you know, hand out money to everyone willy nilly, but that's just my general personal belief. Um, I, I, I'm not you know, someone who really has studied economics in such detail. All right. Well, I appreciate you you taking your swing at it, and and I do want to note for folks here that I've asked you to come on here and, and help demystify AI for us, uh, but it's the semiconductor industry that's like really the bullseye of your expertise. Um, if I get a time here, I might squeeze in one or two questions, but I already know there's not going to be enough time left to do that discussion justice, Dylan. So if you're up for it, I'd love to have you come back on again at some point in the future and really dive deep into semiconductors because that's a huge part of what's driving the global economy here. And it's incredibly strategic in general, but particularly now as we have this whole reshifting of global alliances going on and now reshoring of manufacturing in many cases of, of semiconductors. So um, so anyways, I, I might try to squeeze one or two questions in, like I said, but but I just know I'm not, I'm not going to try to unfairly shortchange you here. The door is open for you to come back on. Um, all right. So back to AI for a moment. Um, uh, and, and, and actually, in your point, sorry, before I leave uh, semis for a second, maybe there's some, it's not a silver bullet, but maybe there's some way to take some of the jobs that are maybe getting displaced by AI and, and, and yet guide some of that displaced workforce into this reshoring um, of some of the new manufacturing that's coming in, that, that, that could be part of the win. Um, all right. So for folks that have been listening to this channel and saying, uh, or listening to this discussion and saying, wow, this is really cool. Um, this does seem transformative. Um, I should probably know more about AI because I think it's probably hard pressed for a viewer here to be working in an in industry that's not going to be touched in some way, shape or form by this revolution. Um, I imagine that you would agree with them to say, yeah, you should learn more about it. You should probably get a little bit of practical experience with it. Um, what are some of the ways people can do that right now? Or do you have any recommendations? If somebody just wants to get a little bit smarter about AI, you know, these are regular people, we're not talking about coders, um, but they just want to get a little bit of, you know, practical, you know, exposure to what we're talking about here. Where can they go? I mean, there are, there are like websites where they can play around with chat, chat GPT for free, right? Yes, I, you know, the, there's there's two you know ways. There's one is hey, go online and find a website that where someone's teaching about AI and you know what have you, and, and and that's absolutely a great method or YouTube videos or what have you. But I think the thing that's gotten you know especially especially folks that are you know maybe less technologically inclined, you know, for example, my brother, right? He's he's in the medical field, but he's not a computer guy, right? How have I gotten him? to you know, think, oh my God, AI, AI is actually gonna change the medical field because he was very dismissive. People have been telling him, hey, uh, you know, AIs are gonna be able to read radiology you know, scans or what have you, right? And MRIs and this and that for years and years. And, and it's constantly been like, no, not really. Um, you know, what's, what's gotten him to really wake up to the awareness is, hey, go on there and start asking it questions. Hey, go on there and ask it to make a lesson plan to teach you about something. And it doesn't need to be about AI. In fact, I, I, I welcome you to not do it about AI. Do it about a topic that you're passionate about. Hey, if you're passionate about jigsaw puzzles, ask it to teach you about the manufacturing process of jigsaw puzzles, right? Or the best strategies for solving jigsaw puzzles and go just keep asking questions and answers and, and hey, can you dive a little bit more into that? 
speak to it like it's a professor. Uh, tell it it's a professor. Tell it's a professor in, in economics, and I'm trying to learn about monetary policy of Keynesian economics, right? This is something I barely know about, but I'm just saying, like, you know, it's probably something you know a lot more about, Adam, right? Uh, and, and, and ask it to do that, right? And ask it, hey, but what is it? Isn't, you know, printing money in, 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 in the recession going to drive huge uh, inflation? Well, that's what's happening right now, right? I mean, you know, ask it these sorts of questions and, and have it talk through. And it's like, no, no, and argue with it, right? Argue with it. Like, no, 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 I think it does this. It's like, no, 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 it does this. It, it, it has, spend the time to just ask it about a topic you know a lot about, because that's where it's really interesting, is when you ask it about a topic you know about, a lot about, you can see the limitations today, but you can also see, wow, this is powerful. Wow, this could, you know, not necessarily disrupt me, maybe because I'm still an expert in my field, but it can teach me about these things. Ask it, to, how do I change a tire? The whole process, right? Ask it about the whole process. You know, oh, you know, it's 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 tremendous. Actually, you know, my my uh my cousin who's who's who's, who's you know younger, she had her first flat tire. She she called her dad. Her dad didn't pick up. She called me. I I, I talked to her a little bit, but I actually pulled up Chad GPT and asked it because I had to visualize, right? What would I have done five years ago? <laughs> when I just pulled up YouTube, right? Because I could explain it, but like, hey, well, how do I actually visualize it and explain it step by step by step? Because some things just seem you know intuitive to someone who's done it before. Right. So whatever it is, you know, ask it. Right. And, and play around with it. It's not going to be perfect, but it's really going to be amazing. Right. So the way I think of it is Chat GPT, the free version, is like an army of 16 year olds who have been set loose on the Internet. And you ask them to do a research project. Great. 16 year olds are still going to make mistakes, but they're great. Right. Chat GPT 4, which is the one you have to pay for, is like an army of college students. Right. But what is the future going to hold? Right. Because college students are obviously going to be wrong and they're going to have their own biases and what have you. But think of it as an army who you know, just are responding to you now, right? And, and, and now think, you know, a student who's in biology, a student who's in, you know, uh, you know, agriculture, a student who's in liberal arts, just, you know, all of them in a room together, sending you an answer, right? That's how I think about it. And so what is the next version gonna be? Wow, that's gonna be a whole lot more impressive. It's a lawyer and a doctor, uh, you know, in the same room, right? Like, and, 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 a, and a machinist, right? It's, it's all these people in a room. So it'll improve over time, but ask it, see the limitations, learn about something that you already know about and learn about something adjacent to it. Learn about something you're curious about. Hey, I, I wanna get into croquet. Ask it about croquet. Ask it about the types of needles you use. I don't, I don't know anything about croquet. Uh, ask it about the types of needles you use and the types of yarn. How is yarn spun? You know, ask it what types of animal. Oh, synthetic yarn. Where's that made? How's that made? Versus, and what are the strengths and properties versus, you know, non-synthetic, right? From from a sheep. I, again, I don't know anything about this, but you know, this is the type of stuff you ask it and actually learn about how you know about its use cases. Because how it works is important. Not everyone needs to know how it works. Honestly, uh, I don't know how a uh, four-cylinder engine really works, right? On a on a Atkinson cycle engine, I barely know how that works. I watched a YouTube video like three days ago. That's why I'm bringing that up. But you know. <laughs> Most people don't know and don't need to know, but what you do need to know is how to drive a car, right? Or, you know, hey, if it makes a sound, I should go to a mechanic, right? And, and, and so, you know, ask it about things you want to learn about um, and, and, try, and ask, argue with it. That's, that's what I would recommend people to do. Great, great. And, and, and just to build on that analogy further, like that's where most people's value add with chat GPT is going to be is learning how to drive it well. Just like, like you, I don't really know much of the physics of why my car works when I drive it, but I know how to drive the car, right? That, that's, that's the value that I, I contribute to it as the driver. Um, all right, so when, when you say, take it for a drive, ask it questions, um, specifically, where can people go? Um, because there are a couple of different sort of AI engines out there, right? I mean, aren't there, does it, isn't Microsoft's different from Google's? Yeah, so, so um, there, there's about a dozen companies who are now in the race, sort of for here. Um, and, and so obviously OpenAI, who's got a huge investment from Microsoft, is sort of the most advanced um, in terms of, but you, you have to, you know, for the, the more advanced version of OpenAI's, which is Microsoft, right, uh, you know, kind of, you can think of them as synonymous, synonymous but they aren't, um, is, is, is chat.openai.com, I believe. You can Google it. I don't, it's not the exact one. So that's ChatGPT. But then the, the, the better one of that is paid, and I would say the paid version is the best in the world right now. But then the next best in the world is if you go to Bard, right? And if you Google Bard, that is Google's. And Google's Bard is free and it has access to the internet. So it can Google, it can search stuff as well. Um, and that's really interesting. Um, then there's, uh, there's oh, Meta has actually made a really impressive one that I would say is the third best in the world called Llama, right? 
li literally llama. And, 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 and it's, it, they've opened it up and it's completely open to the world. And in fact, they've, they've done something, you know, really interesting with the one that they opened to the world. And they, they, did, they didn't do that step that I called, uh, you know, much of the step that I, you know, referred to earlier in the show, reinforcement learning that human feedback. Now, why is that interesting? Because now you have access to sort of the untamed beasts. And in, in that sense, you also have access to, uh, you know, sort of, hey, you know, the, the, tra the people who trained it obviously put some biases into it, right? Hey, don't talk about this, you know, you know, political view, that political view. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a political person, but you can tell that, right? Like there are political views that have also been trained into the AI. So when you're asking it about how to grow corn, it doesn't say anything. But when you start asking it about, you know, Trump versus Biden, obviously you're getting very uh, different results. Um, so, and, and, and I, I recommend you don't ask it about political stuff, ask it about practical things, things that actually are useful to know about, and discuss in life, um, not politics. Uh, but, but, you know, there's, there's Meta has released that and there's, there's, you know, Anthropic, but I would say the two main ones to really focus on today would be chat GPT. So you just search that or chat open, uh, openai.com. And the other one would be Bard. So Google Bard. Uh, bard.google.com, I believe. Um, and Google those, I might not have the exact websites. All right, great. For and many, yeah, they're in the description. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, and you said that that the chat GPT version uh, by OpenAI and Microsoft, um, that there is a, there's a paid version of that that you said is, is their best version. H how much is that paid version? Uh, it's $20 a month. And so, I, I, you know, I think play around with the free version, play around with Google's version. You'll, you know, play around with it as in like consciously make the effort to sit down and talk to it for a couple hours, right? Spend a couple hours, play with it, talk to it, and now go and try. And, and, and then I would say go and pay for it. That's what I personally do. Um, that's what I know, a lot of people I know personally do. Um, and, and then play with that one. And you can cancel it after a month. I think they actually give you a refund window that's pretty short. So even if you don't like it, you can refund it immediately. But right. then play but, with the, but, the, but twenty dollars a month to have an infinite number of college students there to answer any question you have. It's 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 pretty good value. <laughs> yeah, the the and and they have this other method, right? The only way to access the AI isn't Chat GPT, but that's the user friendly way. They have another way where you can put it into your application with what's called an API. Um, and and the funny thing is the way I like to, and, and what they do is they charge, uh, I believe it's six cents per. Uh, 750 words, about more or less. Six cents for 750 words to be generated. It's incredibly cheap when you think about it. Um, so, so, but obviously the chat, the, the nice user interface and all of that costs a little bit more money. Um, so, but uh, it, it, it's, 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 um, I kind of lost my train of thought, but it's impressive. All right. Um, well, look, uh, I, we're wrapping up here. I'm, I'm going to make the call now. I'm not going to get into the semiconductor uh, part of the discussion because we just don't have time and that would not be fair to you. But a couple key concluding questions. One is, so, you know, wrapping everything you've, you've said together sounds like tremendous opportunity lies ahead uh, to, to leverage the benefits of, of AI. And, and it's probably going to unlock trillions of, of, of uh, added value to the economy. And if you disagree with that number, feel free to reduce it or, or raise it depending upon your, your own point of view. Um, what, what companies are, do you think are, are best positioned to take advantage of it? So we, we talked about Microsoft and Google that are, that are building the platform itself. Um, be interesting to see how much they are able to monetize that going forward. Um, but I presume just companies that use this technology uh, who can dramatically reduce their cost footprint and or increase uh, their productivity, um, you know, may stand to just make tons of, of incremental profit from this. So I'm curious, are, are there companies out there or sectors out there that you're watching really closely here in terms of where you think the spoils are going are gonna to go to from the AI movement? So, you know, obviously I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a chip person, not as much of a software person, although I have been in the past. Um, but I, I agree with your assessment that the companies that use it are going to benefit tremendously. Um, and so, I mean, one of the ones that I've played around with is Adobe and their integration of not, not the language models, but the image models, right? Generating images or being able to take a photo of the beach with this and that and saying, hey, can you turn this into a snowy field? And it actually does it. And it's amazing, right? These are the, these are, this is another sort of Adobe is a really interesting one. Um, service now, you know, there's a lot of companies that have 
the user, right? So Microsoft and Google, of course, right? Uh, I think Meta's uh, really not so far behind both of them. Um, and, and, and there's many others, but the sort of the place that I really focus in on and, and, and such is the infrastructure to build it. Right, and those 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 have obviously uh, you know at least for an investment type audience have gone up like crazy. Um, but right, like like uh, like Nvidia, which is trading at like forty times sales right now, right? I mean, just bunkers. Well, yeah, you, you look at it's forty times sales, but if you uh, if you project next year's earnings, it's maybe only uh, you know forty to fifty times earnings of next year, right? So it's it's the the amount of growth, the amount of orders that they're getting re they're receiving from all the big tech companies like Meta like Microsoft and list goes on and on, uh, not just big tech companies, but enterprise enterprises like Walmart, you know, on and on and on. Uh, their, their, their orders are absurd, but it's not just, you know, NVIDIA is not building everything. There's so many other pieces of the supply chain around it. Um, and that's sort of what I'm more so focused in on. Okay. Um, well, look, as this, as this continues to play out, we'd love to have you come back on, not just to update us on the semiconductor industry too, but also, Give us updates on what's happening in, in AI and what's catching your attention. Um, the last question sort of on this thread is, is I've interviewed one or two people recently on this channel uh, who are not as steeped in AI as you, um, but they've looked at sort of past um, technological revolutions, you can say, you know, the launch of the internet, uh, you know, RCA back during, uh, you know, the, the, the advent of television. Um, and have seen a pattern where uh, the market wakes up to the, the market opportunity of the new technology, brings a lot of that future market value into today, have you know, just massive run-ups in the companies that are involved in this space. Uh, and, and then it takes more time than the market originally thought for that value to actually be realized. And in most cases, it is realized over time. It just takes a decade or two. Um, and therefore, you get things like Amazon stock, you know, going to 100 bucks a share in the late 90s, um, then falling in that case extremely by like 96 percent, and getting back and then far exceeding 100 bucks a share. But it took a decade or more to get back to that original 100 dollars a share. D d do you see us being in any danger of uh, repeating that cycle right now, given some of the the euphoria you're seeing in the market around AI right now? Um, so I've, I've heard, you know, sort of that line of thinking and absolutely, absolutely, sorry, I've heard that line of thinking many times and absolutely it's it's happened and it probably happens again. Where we are in that hype cycle stage, I'm not sure, right? But I, I personally believe generative AI is somewhere between the invention of the uh, internal combustion engine and the internet, right? I, I think the impact on the world is somewhere between the two, um, you know, more than the internet and uh, maybe less than the internal combustion engine. Uh, so, so somewhere in between those two are steam engine, right? Um, is, is where I think AI is. And, and, and the other thing is the pattern across humanity is the time it's taken for a new invention to impact the world has gotten shorter and shorter and shorter mm -hmm. and shorter, right? So, so when, this, when the steam engine was invented and when it was actually deployed was, was much longer than when the internal combustion was, that, which was much longer than when oil refining was, which was much longer than plastics was, which is much longer uh, than than the internet, right? And, and well, semiconductors and then the internet and and you know cloud computing, right? All of these cycles have been shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And so AI, we probably do overshoot, right, on the stocks, uh, without a doubt, right, on the market value. Um, and we probably tank at some point. I don't know how much. Probably not, you know, as much as ninety six percent on companies like Microsoft and Google, but in Nvidia. But probably, probably, you know, we overshoot. And is that today, or is that is that still a year from now? Or I, I, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, but. Um, I also think the innovation from it is happening much faster than people recognize. Uh, people's work is already being transformed, uh, you know, much faster than when people are like, oh, the internet's going to be amazing. And I was like, well, what are we actually doing right now? We're just sending each other messages slightly faster. Um, and it took a while for people to, you know, get to the point where it's like, oh, I just consume all my content on the internet and, oh, you know, not, not, not cable TV. And, oh, I, I actually, you know, use cloud computing, not, you know, not a PC, right. And so on and so on and so forth. And, and it unlocks so much value. I think that time cycle is going to be much shorter for AI. Um, and, and we probably still do overshoot on valuations, of course. Okay. All right. Um, last question before we wrap things up. Um, uh, I just have to ask it because it comes glove in hand with AI discussions these days. So um, 
you know, the one of the fears of AI is the whole Skynet risk, right? Which is that one day, you know, this artificial intelligence, uh, the, the narrative is, is the intelligence is getting faster at an exponential rate. And at some point it gets smarter than us. And then it gets way smarter than us even faster because it's growing exponentially. And at some point it just takes over. Um, you know, you've talked about the AI that we've been talking about here is much more brute force. So it's not really an intelligent organization, but I just got to ask, what, what's, what's your level of threat assessment on the Skynet risk from this technology? Um, you know, some days I'm like, yeah, it's going to happen. And some days I'm like, no, 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 it won't happen anytime soon. Uh, I flip flop. But then, you know, if you listen to the people who build it, they fully believe it's a risk, right? If you look at the, the, the heads of OpenAI, if you talk to them, they think, you know, maybe, maybe it doesn't actually just, it's not just smarter than us or, and it kills us. Maybe they, they think a lot of the time, a lot of the risk is, hey, this is all of human intelligence right there in an instant, right? An army of college kids. The next version is an army of doctors and lawyers and so on and so forth. If the wrong person gets in, 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 in you know, a hold of it, they're able to teach themselves how to create the next pandemic and they don't need to be an expert, right? They're able to figure out, oh, I need to mix this molecule and this molecule. And hey, with this genetic sequence, if I modify it this way, I'll create COVID-25, which is a hundred times more lethal than COVID-19 was, right? Or so on and so forth, right? Or, hey, I'm able to figure out how to build a nuclear bomb much easier. Or, hey, I'm able to figure out the exact terrorist attack to plan to cause, uh, you know, Russia to launch a nuke into Ukraine, which then causes the U.S. to, you know, do this and that, and then it sets off a whole chain of reactions with the wrong person directing the AI to help them do something, right? It doesn't necessarily need to be smarter than us for huge risk. It just needs to be smart enough for bad people to be able to do bad things, right? And so that's the that's what I think is the more risk, bigger risk than like, oh my God, it's gonna get so smart, it destroys all of humanity. Because I think even if it gets so smart, it'll, there will be so many tasks that humans are better than it at, like fine motor skills, right? You know, being able to pick up things, be able to put things together, you know, sort of things like that, that it might not be great at. Um, you know, even even with robots, right? Or, hey, build the robots to help me do this thing, right? You know, there, there's a lot of things that I won't be good at that I think if it's even, if it's way smarter than us, thinking on its own, not like a large language model is but actually thinking on its own, it'll probably keep us around for long enough that we don't even realize that it's already, you know, taken us over and then the switch flips overnight. But really, I think the real risk is a bad person getting in charge of something that doesn't think and it's just helping them, right? Like, hey, I want to generate this and that and this and that. And there's actually good reasons to build you know, something that spreads, right, with, with regards to like, hey, I'm actually trying to do this thing to specifically target cancer cells. That's what that's what chemotherapy is, right? Trying to kill, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to kill you, but only a specific part of you, right? And that's what chemotherapy is. So, so why aren't there use cases where something like that is being done and you're tricking the AI and helping you build something that's actually horrible, right? So that's sort of what the bigger risk is to me personally. All right. And um Super interesting thread. Um, hard to to leave on that, but but just real quick, are, are there institutions, organizations, federations that are kind of working on standards or, yeah, I guess practices and standards amongst the folks in the AI community to at least try to reduce some of the risk of that. Uh, so so the the head of OpenAI is currently on a global tour basically telling all the governments we need to be regulated. And now there's two ways to look at it, right? One is he actually just wants everyone to be regulated. So he gets to, you know, he's the, he's the one in charge, you know, and, you know, there's no more competitors for him. And then the other yeah. angle is actually he's worried about this, right? And I, I, you know, I flip back and forth. What is he, what is he trying to do? What's his motive here by going to, you know, every country in the world and telling them we need to re regulate AI? Uh, because, you know, there's a lot of industries that go around and say, I mean, this is what the healthcare industry does, right? The pharmaceutical industry say, hey, regulate us. Hey, yeah, we're the only one of only three people who can produce insulin, even though it's like 80 years old, right? And now we can charge whatever prices we want to charge because there's one of three people, right? So there's there's the sort of like negative angle of it too. Um, but there's not really any institutions doing this yet. In fact, the people who are banging on the table for the most regulation or, or doing the AI safety are the people who are actually building these models. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and open AI is only an organization of less than 500 people. Right. Um, so it's like, you know, there are no checks and balances today, but at the same time, they're rallying for checks and balances. And could it be sort of like a, you know, pharmaceutical industry time trying to get a uh, monopoly over EpiPens or, or, or insulin type of example? Or is it actually them like worried? Right. And, and the well, I guess the other element here, too, is is. You know, once it's out in the world, which it more or less is and getting out there more every day, um, 
you know, not every every country sees the world the same way, right? And so you might have a big block uh, that says, yes, it's important to us. You know, the climate accords is a good example. Not every country is a signatory of that, right? You might have other countries who just say, no, forget it. I'm gonna I'm gonna do whatever I want with this thing, right? So. All right, we'll have to leave it there on that. But again, love to have you come back on the program here. Maybe we can delve more into some of these more nuanced topics uh, when you're back on and we have more time to do so. Um, uh, well, as we wrap things up here, uh, I just want to say, Dylan, thanks so much. It's been a fascinating discussion and you really have helped me understand this uh, new technology a lot more. Um, for folks that have really enjoyed this discussion, if this was their first time getting exposure to you, where can they go to follow you and your work? Yeah, so we, we have a website, www.semianalysis.com. If you want more like official reports, um, you know, I have a Twitter, of course, which is Dylan522P, uh, where I more so tweet my like, you know, open thoughts, which are maybe not as uh, well researched, but, you know, my hot takes, which I think are more, you know, personal. Um, um, and, and, and I think those are probably the best two places to find me or Twitter or the website, you know, where we actually publish our research. A lot of it is, is given away for free, obviously, as a sort of a means of generating real business. Um, so, so, you know, I think, I think you can, a lot of people can just read it for free and, and see if, see if they like what we're doing, um, you know, me and my team. Um, so I think those are the best two ways. All right, great. And like I said, Dylan, um, doors open here to have you come back on and talk more about, uh, this really, uh, seminal, uh, transition, uh, as it continues to evolve and, and we get a clearer picture of what's going on. And again, I want to be back on too to talk about the semiconductor industry. Um, all right. Well, look, uh, folks, if you've enjoyed this discussion with Dylan, would like to see him come back on, please uh, vote your support for that by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Dylan, I want to thank you so much again. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thanks for having me. All right, everyone else. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you.